let's go. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending the second to last session of the Tour de France from A to Z. Uh, I can believe that it's all, already the, the eighth presentation. So thank you for following this uh, program all the way through, or just if you're taking only like one every once in a while, that's already very nice. So thank you for attending this program. Um, so once again, this one will be uh, re um, sorry recorded and put on the YouTube channel. So it will be accessible uh, from the Princeton Public Library YouTube channel in just a few days. Uh, so I have to say that I had to be creative for this one because coming to the end of the alphabet, it gets a bit tricky to find some interesting cities, uh, starting with ex especially like W. Uh, yeah, W was the trickiest, I think. I had a couple of ideas in you, but yeah, W, it was very hard. So I got to do a couple of pirouettes to like yeah, find some interesting things to share with you. So today I'm going to tell you more about Ursi, Versailles, and We oui, Di Joli Village. So starting with Ursi, which is located in Burgundy, in the center east of France. Uh, so that's a region I didn't have the opportunity to tell you about so far. So it's a very good opportunity for me to tell you about Burgundy. And I'll be completely honest, I'm using this uh, village just as an excuse to talk about Burgundy in general, but I don't have much to say about Ursi itself, except that it was uh, the home of the writer Alphonse de Lamartine between 1826 and 1831. And apparently, uh, so he bought um, uh, the castle of Monculo in uh, Ursi, and he uh, renovated it and embellished it, but he got so much into debt because of it that he had to sell it again in 1831. So yeah, I won't talk much about Ursi itself, but really more about uh, Burgundy as a whole. So the area is actually quite rural uh, and the density of population is quite low. Apparently there are actually less people who live in Burgundy now than uh, two centuries ago. So to give you an idea, there are about 1.5 million who live in Burgundy as a whole. So if you see my arrow, Burgundy is basically over here. So the area is actually located between Ile-de-France, so the broad area where Paris is located, and Lyon, uh, which is located over here. So Burgundy is actually really in the middle of those two uh, regions. That's why, yeah, like, yeah the population is actually very attracted by these two very important poles. Uh, but so yeah, people tend to leave the region, uh, but it has a lot of nice treasures that I'm going to share with you in just a second. So uh, the biggest city of Burgundy is Dijon, exactly like the mustard, yes. Uh, as you may have heard about Burgundy because it turns out to be one of France's main wine producing areas. So I've uh, been able in the past presentations to uh, tell you already about some wine regions but yeah that's one more that you can check on your list of wines to know more about all right so we'll start the visit of burgundy with dijon which is the capital of the his historical duchy of burgundy um so if you wander around Dijon's whole town, uh, you will see a lot of half-timbered houses, uh, most of the time colored in red, uh, with polychrome roofs, so roof of several colors, as well as Romanesque and Gothic churches, 17th and 18th century private mansions, medieval streets, and so on. So I have to say that it's a region that I absolutely never visited in my life. So I've learned a lot of things while uh, working on, the, uh, on today's session. So I'm very happy to share my new knowledge with you. So then I'm, I would be quite excited now to visit Dijon as I learned more about it. So um, after visiting Old Town, you can uh, go to the Palace of the Dukes and Estates of Burgundy, which hosts the city hall, as well as the Fine Art Museum, the Municipal Archives, and the Tourist Information Center. So that's this building right here. So <clears throat> uh, the oldest parts of the building actually date from the 15th century, and 
further additions and renovations were made between the 16th and the 19th century. Uh, so you can see the ducal kitchens, the gods room, and the former grand reception room of the dukes uh, in the Fine Arts Museum of Dijon, so which is located somewhere in that building. I don't know exactly where though. Uh, so the tower that you can see here, so is the tower of Philip the Good, which was built in the 16th century, and it's about 150 feet high. Uh, so it's open to visitors uh, through the information uh, tourist information center, and so from there you can have a very good view over uh, the city of Dijon. After Dijon, you can uh, drive to the Font Fontenay Abbey, which is located in the north of Burgundy. So this uh, place, and so uh, first I have to say that uh, very important religious sites were actually built in Burgundy in the Middle Ages, so, such as monasteries, abbeys, and churches, and most of them are still preserved today. So Fontenay Abbey is actually a very good example of that as it's the oldest Cistercian abbey preserved in the world as it was founded in 1188, so more than 900 years ago. Uh, so, this, so the monks actually uh, left this abbey uh, after the French Revolution in 1789. Then it was actually transformed uh, into a paper factory between 1791 and 1905. And it happens to belong to the same family since 1820. And this family uh, started restoring uh, the abbey after uh, the paper factory closed. Uh, so it's open to the public today, even if it still belongs to that family and is a kind of, uh, so it's a private property, property but open to, to visit for the public. Uh, and so most of the spaces, uh, so the church, uh, the cloisters, the, um, the gardens, the dormitory, and the workstations are open to visit. Uh, so this Fontenay Abbey actually attracts more than 100,000 visitors per year, and it happens to be a good movie set, uh, as it has several uh, movies uh, and TV productions, at least some scenes of movies and TV productions were shot over there. Uh, such as the Three Musketeers, uh, so the movie, French movie from 1961, as well as Cyrano de Bergerac, uh, shot in 1990 with Gérard Depardieu. So the very last scene uh, was shot in, in uh, Fontenay Abbey. And it's a uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1981. Then you can go a bit south and go to Vézelay. Uh, so Vézelay is a very picturesque village with uh, Renaissance houses and cobbled streets. Even though the village has only 400 inhabitants all year round, it has a lot of characters. So it is known as uh, the Eternal Hill. And over there, as you can see on the picture, uh, the main uh, interest of the village is the Basilica of St. Mary Madeleine, which was built in the 12th, 12th century and happens to be on the way of Santiago de Compostela. So <clears throat> uh, pilgrims as well as kings from all over Europe have been coming there for the past thousand years uh, to worship the relics of St. Madeleine before either carrying along to the way of Santiago de Compostela or before going uh, for crusades uh, during the Middle Ages. Uh, so to continue with the movie sets, if you've ever seen La Grande Vadrouille, which is one of the most famous French comedy, uh, most of, one of the most famous French comedies ever. So this one was shot in, in 1966 and some of the scenes were actually shot in the village. Uh, so the hill as a, and the church were listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site since uh, 1979. And so from the village, you can have a very nice view over the Morvan uh, Natural Park that I'm going to tell you, um, that I'm, yeah, that I'm going to give you more information about in just a minute. But before, so yeah, I want to, uh, make you meditate over the very nice view of this village over here. And this quote from Prosper Mérimée, Mérimé, sorry, uh, taken from notes from a trip in the south of France written in 1835. 
The sun was coming up. There was still a thick mist hanging over the valley, and I could see the treetops piercing through heat here and there. Up above, the village stood like a pyramid reflecting the lights. It was a magnificent sight, and it was full of admiration that I made for the Church of St. Madeleine. So yeah, the, the view of the village is very, very pretty. All right, so as I mentioned, uh, the more for natural regional boundaries earlier. So first, if you have a look at the map, so that will actually help you to know, to understand more the geography of the area. So the Morvan National uh, Park, Natural Park, sorry, uh, so is in green on the picture. And so as we can see, Ile-de-France, so where Paris is located, like the main region where Paris is located is in the northwest. And Rhône-Alpes, when, where Lyon is located in the southeast, uh, so it's really uh, between those two regions. So uh, Vesle is actually located at the very uh, north, um, west stop of the Morvan Natural Regional Park. And I was telling you about the Abbey Justeria, which is actually located over here in Montbard. And Dijon is located over here in the, in the east of the Bourgogne region. So this map uh, is actually dates from before the uh, Burgundy region actually fusioned uh, with Franche-Comté. So now it's like yeah, the administrative uh, map is not the same anymore, but that gives you an idea of how the um, region used to be organized between 2016. So the Morvan Natural Regional Park encompasses, you know, represents about 1150 square miles and encompasses 137 towns. Uh, if you go over there, you can stop at the Maison du Parc, which is an estate with an information center. Uh, will you were will you will learn uh, about the Morvan environment as well as the local flora and fauna? Uh, so over there, you can find a botanical garden with an arboretum where you can find some trees, as well as medieval medicinal herb gardens uh, with local plants as well and uh, follow the discovering trails around the Toro Pond. Uh, so at the same Maison du Parc, they have two museums, one called the House of Humans and Landscapes, uh, which have exhibits about the relationship between mankind and the environment. And the other one, the Museum of Resistance in Morvan, uh, retraces the history of the uh, movements in the area during World War II. Uh, if you climb to uh, the Beuvre Mount, uh, you will find Bibract, which is an archaeological museum on the site um, of uh, on the site of, uh, of the fortified capital of the Edui, a Gallic tribe that was built in the second century BC, so at the top of Mont Beuvre. Uh, so over there, you can see some exhibits of objects from the Gallo-Roman era, uh, such as tools, um, statues, uh, and so on, like arts, as well as uh, exhibits about the archaeological, war archaeological work and the ex excavation process uh, that helped finding actually all those um, arts and, uh, and tools. Um, so if you are interested in that side of history, in that uh, era of history, there is actually uh, another museum of, um, I would say like, yeah, uh, a Gallic museum, uh, which is called, which is located in Alesia. So it's, uh, I would say, northeast uh, of the Morvan Natural Park. And so, yes, that's actually where uh, Vercingetorix, so the Gallic leader, was uh, defeated by uh, the army, uh, the Roman army of Jules Caesar. Um, I can't remember the year though. But so yeah, it's located about one hour and 30 minutes away uh, from the Morvan Natural Regional Park uh, by car. And so this park is actually a very good uh, spot when it comes to sports. So you can do canoeing, kayaking, rafting on lakes and uh, wild rivers, as well as hiking. Uh, they have more like 19 mi 900 miles, sorry, of hiking trails. Um, for mountain biking as well, they have more than 1,500 miles of bike trails, and you can do horse riding as well if you like it. 
as they have uh, more than 370 miles of horse riding trails. So here you have a view of the uh, of the Marvel National Park, Natural Park, sorry. So even though uh, Burgundy is quite a rural area, they still organize quite a few festivals all year round, starting with the Vif Festival, which is an eclectic music festival that happens in Dijon uh, during one weekend, usually in June, uh, as well as conferences and activities about solidarity and sustainability. Uh, Les Acros de Maru is a one-week festival of street and performing arts that uh, happens usually at the beginning of July in Nevers, so in the west uh, of Burgundy. So if you go there, you will see circus, magic, performances, uh, concerts, as well as plays. Image Sonore uh, is uh, that we can translate as audible image is a festival of classical and electronic music, which uh, happens during one weekend in July, uh, both in the courtyard of a castle, as well as uh, Alésia, uh, which I just mentioned before. And Chalon dans ma rue is another uh, street art festival that uh, happens in Chalon sur saône This one lasts for a week as well. And more than 150 troops from all over the world come to perform their shows. So during the whole week, there are more than a thousand shows uh, in total uh, during the whole festival. So talking about food. So Burgundy has quite a few uh, specialties, starting with the Dijon mustard. Uh, so it was actually very, it's, been very popular since uh, the Burgundy Dukes, actually. So it's been made, produced for, uh, for a very long time, over centuries now. And so there's only one uh, factory now that uh, makes authentic traditional mustard made from grains grown in Burgundy and grown by, grown, sorry, grown by millstones in Burgundy. Uh, but yeah, apparently the Dijon mustard recipe has been protected by a decree since 1937, so I can't tell you exactly how it's made of. So then we have the œufs en murette. So basically it's poached eggs in red wine sauce, so the murette sauce served uh, on toasts. So the murette sauce uh, is made with burgundy wine, as well as lardon, onions, and shallots browned in butter. And the most emblematic uh, dish that you can try in Burgundy is the bœuf bourguignon, of course. Uh, so this iconic specialty is made is actually a beef stew uh, cooked in red wine from Burgundy, of course, uh, with, usually with garlic, button onions, and lardons. And you can add mushrooms. You can serve it with potatoes and other vegetables. And uh, in Burgundy, you can find a very peculiar cheese called Epoisse. So it's a soft wash rind cheese uh, made from cow's milk and ripened with Burgundy Mark, uh, a brandy distilled from the grape pomace. So I tried it. It has a very strong smell, I'd rather tell you, but it's, it tastes really, really nice. Uh, so like, yeah, I would say that it smells more, I mean, like, yeah, it's... Don't like it. Don't uh, be fooled by its very strong smell. It actually don't taste as strong as it smells. So talking about wine this time. So I said earlier that Burgundy is one of the main uh, wine producing regions of France, and so the vineyard, the vineyards in Burgundy, stretch for. Uh, 250 kilometers, so that's roughly 150 miles from Chablis in the north. If you see the little map at the bottom of the screen, so that's the uh, yellow area, uh, to the Macone in the south, so the green parts over there. So overall, it, uh, comp it comprises 32,000 hectares, so about 80,000 acres of vineyards. So the, wine, the grapes used in that vineyard are mostly Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So those two varieties represent 90% of uh, all the grapes uh, cultivated in Burgundy. 
And as for uh, the production repartition, so Burgundy produces more white wine. So 62% of their production is white wine, 29% red wine, and 9% Cremant, so sparkling wine, and only 1% rosé. <clears throat> so there are six winemaking regions uh, in the area. So from north to south, so Chablis and Grand Auxerrois in the north west, uh, the Châtillonnet in the north of Burgundy, and then uh, from the south of Dijon, uh, if I move myself, so south of Dijon uh, with the Côte de Nuit, then Côte de Beaune, Côte Chalonnaise, and the Maconnais. So technically, uh, Beaujolais is also attached to the Burgundy wine area, even though it's uh, actually closer to Lyon, but for administrative reasons, it's been attached to um, the Burgundy area. We can see it on this map, but I, I wanted to tell you that as well. So a very specific term that you will hear, that you will hear uh, when you will be talking about wine in Burgundy is clima. So that you can translate in climate, but it's actually not related at all to the weather in the area. A clima is a vine plot with unique soil and natural conditions. So it's like a single uh, vine plots. <clears throat> uh, so basically they've been uh, uh, delineated by stone walls uh, that mark out each uh, and every clima. And that's, uh, those stone walls were actually, uh, have been built over centuries and those clima have been uh, demarcated uh, a long time ago. And so this term, you will only hear it uh, for the Bogan, uh, Burgundy vine, oh, Burgundy vine, wine, sorry, not in any other wine uh, making region. And so the wines are actually named after the clima the grapes were cultivating in. And in total, there are more than 1,200 clima uh, in the Burgundy area. And so just so you know, Burgundy uh, produces 1% of Grand Cru wines in total. So I have a question for you. How many bottles of wine are produced each year in the Burgundy area? Just so you know, we're talking about in terms of million. So how many millions of bottles are produced in the Burgundy area each year? If you want to unmute yourself or send your answer to the chat. Okay, well, I can give you the answer still. So it's actually more than 200 million bottles that are produced uh, in Burgundy each year. So the production was actually 233 million of bottles for 2022. Uh, so here actually you have an illustration of what a clima is. So as you can see, so there's a, a plot, a vine plot very, um, I would say like, yeah, uh, you can see the limit of the plot as well with this stone wall here that uh, mark the limits of the Musigny um, clima. So if you want to uh, know, actually is the most expensive bottle of Burgundy wine costs about 33,000 euros. And that's the most expensive that you can find in France, produced in France. Uh, so uh, that one is actually coming from uh, Musigny and is a Grand Cru from 2006 uh, from the Côte de, Côte de Nuit area. And so, uh, like other wine regions, many, vi many vineyards and cellars are open for visits and wine tasting. So it's definitely a good way to know the regions a bit more. And fun fact, King Louis XIV was actually prescribed Vin de Nuit by his doctor. Uh, so even in the 17th century, the reputation of the Côte de Nuit wines were very high. Uh, so apparently, uh, Côte de Nuit wines are more tannic and less acidic than champagne. And that's the reason why his doctor prescribed uh, with the, King Louis XIV to drink some. Uh, 
And so still today, as you can see, uh, Côte de Nuit are among the most reputed, reputed and most expensive wines of uh, Burgundy today. So now going to different regions. So I'm going to talk you to tell you more about uh, Versailles. Um, so because I've already talked about Paris uh, in a previous session, I won't uh, give you like special like food uh, specialties today because there is nothing more to add uh, that comes from Versailles. And I will uh, mainly tell you about the um, Versailles Palace today. So Versailles is located about 17 kilometers away, so 10 miles away uh, from the center of Paris. Uh, you can definitely take a train uh, from Paris city center uh, until to go to Versailles. It takes about 30 minutes, roughly, depending on if there's a works or a strike uh, happening at the moment. But usually it should take you about 30 minutes. Uh, so the construction of the city and palace of Versailles were actually ordered by King Louis XIV in the second half of the 17th century. So uh, there used to be uh, a village um, already before the city was built, but basically everything was destroyed to build the new city, as well as the palace. Uh, there used to be uh, King Louis XIII's hunting lodge, but he made it... Uh, completely, like, yeah, basically, he ordered to erase it to build uh, the new palace. The, the construction started in 1661, I think, uh, and was extended for uh, decades, and some additions were made uh, in the further, uh, in the next centuries by the next kings. So uh, the Palace of Versailles was actually the political center of France from 1682 to the French Revolution until seven, in 1789. And so fun fact about Versailles. Um, so because of its uh, symmetry, which gave it a modern looks, uh, Versailles was actually used as a model uh, to build Washington DC. Uh, you may have heard about L'Enfant, who was the architect to build DC. So like he definitely uh, drew his inspiration from uh, Versailles city. As you can see, it's quite geometrical with like very long alleys, like geometric alley and like lines uh, that go from the palace and cross the whole city. And so the palace and gardens of Versailles are listed on the UNESCO World uh, as uh, UNESCO World Heritage Sites. So how many rooms do you think that uh, there are in the Palace of Versailles? Same if you want to write in the chat or unmute yourself to try to give an answer. 1500, like, sorry, 1500, uh, a bit more than that. So there are actually 2,300 rooms uh, in the Palace of Versailles in total, and only 1,000 are open uh, to visitors. Uh, so the main architects of uh, so the palace were Louis Levaux at the very beginning of the construction of the palace and Jules Ardouin Mansart uh, a bit later when it comes to the buildings and André Le Nôtre was the main uh, landscape architects who designed uh, the gardens of the Palace of Versailles. So starting uh, with the Hall of Mirrors, which is, I think, the most emblematic uh, room in the whole Palace of Versailles. So I actually can't remember if I visited the palace when I was young. I must have been very, very young because I, I don't have any memory of visiting it, but I'm pretty sure that it's like, yeah, usually like a school trip that you take. So I might have gone there and I definitely want to go there again. So the Hall of Mirrors was built between 1678 and 1684, so designed by uh, architect Ardouin Mansart that I just mentioned uh, before. Um, so in this gallery, which is about 73 meters long, so 240 feet long, you will find 357 mirrors uh, that face uh, the window. So 
this basically uh, whole this room uh, has been built as a way to pay tribute to the political economic and artistic success uh, of France at the time. So you will find 30 paintings by Charles Lebrun on the ceiling, um, which basically illustrates uh, Louis XIV's military victories. Um, so like, and so yes, so the, which represent, uh, as I said, so the political tribute and as well, so uh, the 357 mirrors are quite huge in the sense that at the time, most of the mirror were actually made in Italy. So it was a way for uh, King Louis XIV to show that France had uh, the craftsman, uh, craftsmanship to uh, make mirrors as well, and that they could be independent from uh, Italy to make mirrors. So at each extremity of the hall of mirrors, you will find the war room and the peace room. So uh, the war room, basically, <clears throat> uh, you will have some uh, paintings and decorations um, depicting uh, the uh, military victories of Louis XIV. And in the peace hall, um, in the peace room, uh, so it will you will have some more decoration, but this time uh, that depict more uh, basically the good that came out of this war and the peace that was brought by the victory of France uh, in the whole of Europe. And so this uh, whole of mirrors is still used today and has been used, for example, to sign the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, that was uh, actually a treaty that uh, officialized the end of the First World War. So it was signed in the Hall of Mirrors on June 28, 1919. And so still today, uh, it serves as a reception space for official guests, so, such as uh, Queen Elizabeth II or John F. Kennedy with Jackie Kennedy and so on. After going through the Hall of Mirrors, you can definitely go to the gardens. Uh, so their construction started in 1661 and it took about 40 years to uh, complete them. So they were designed mainly by André Le Nôtre, that I mentioned before. And so it took them, it took a very long time uh, to build the gardens as the place was actually originally made up of meadows and swamps. And so, fun facts, to maintain uh, its design, the garden needs to be replanted approximately on, uh, once every 100 years. So the last time was actually um, in the early 2000s, after a huge storm devastated parts of the gardens in the 1990s. Uh, so at the end of the, um, of the garden, you can see that there's a very, very big park that uh, actually covers 800 hectares, so 2,000 acres. So the park and gardens of Versailles are actually twice as big as the surface of Central Park. So if you can imagine how big that is, that's, yeah, that's actually way bigger than I uh, thought it was. So the canal that you can see at the back of the picture is actually uh, more than a kilometer long. Uh, so uh, 5,500 uh, feet long. And <clears throat> so, yeah, quite, quite huge as well. And so the uh, park is accessible. The park, uh, so at the back of the estate, is accessible all year round and it's free for uh, pedestrians and cyclists. So if you don't want to visit the castle but just want to go to the park, that's absolutely possible and free. Uh, so after the main palace, you can walk to the Triano estate. Uh, so the Grand Tri so it's composed of uh, several buildings. So starting with the Grand Triano, uh, which was built uh, during Louis XIV's reign, then the Petit Triano, which was completely completed sorry during Louis XV's reign in 1768. Uh, actually, Marie Antoinette was offered the Petit Trianon by Louis XVI and spent a lot of time there and in the gardens as well. So, like, yeah, there's the Queen Hamlet as well. Um, uh, that was built in the 1780s. Uh, 
whose design was actually inspired by uh, the architecture of Normandy. So it's basically uh, a tiny, tiny village that has been built uh, on the estate uh, with a windmill, a dairy, uh, as well as leisure spaces such as a salon, a billiard room, a boudoir. Um, Sorry. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, the Queen's Theater was uh, built in 1780. And in this theater, so Marie Antoinette, Queen Marie Antoinette attended private performances and uh, performed herself, as apparently she uh, liked uh, going on the stage. And finally, so the stables. So uh, two stables were uh, built between 1679 and 1682. So that was a way to underline the importance of horses uh, at the time. So there are, as I said, two stables. So the main stable and the small stable, they both have the same size, but they actually did not have the same uh, purpose. So, <clears throat> In the main, main stables, uh, so you could find the how the carriage and horses of the king and the princes, uh, as well as the horses that were trained for war and hunt, and the small stables. So over there, you would find all the other horses. So uh, the one for like towing and for uh, leisure, I would say, um, and like yeah, we would um, basically. Uh, to everyday carriages, like not ceremony carriages. So there were more than 2,000 horses uh, at a time in the royal stables in the 18th century. So that's, so yeah, that basically tells you how huge uh, those stables were and how, yeah, how important the, the, the um, like, yeah, how important horses were for, um, for the king at the time. So uh, you can actually see uh, and attend an equestrian show performed on weekends by the National Equestrian Academy of the Estate of Versailles. So if you are, if you like uh, horse shows, you should definitely attend. Um, it's like, yeah, I think it's based on uh, 18th century traditions. So that may be something very interesting to, to watch. And in those tables, two museum spaces were created uh, quite recently. So a gallery of couches in the main stables where you can see, so those uh, couches right here and right there. So ceremony uh, carriages that were taken for very important occasions. Uh, and in the small uh, stables, there's a mold and statue gallery that um, actually hosts uh, original and copies of statues from the palace, uh, from the palace's garden, as well as uh, some statues from the Louvre Museum. Yeah. Some events happen uh, at the uh, Palace of Versailles. So they have their own cultural program, as you can see, but there are also some other um, uh, cultural events and festivals that uh, take place in the festival uh, uh, in the palace, such as the Versailles Electro Festival, um, which is an electronic music festival, as its name implies. Uh, so this one happens in May June, uh, and it's a new initiative as it started in 2021. So there are some DJ sets that happen in the palace's garden, uh, and as well as some uh, other cities around Versailles. So the night fountain shows, uh, so every Saturday in summer from mid-June to mid-September, uh, there's a light and water show on the multiple fountains in the garden and the groves. Uh, so the groves, which are actually usually close to the public. And so there's Baroque music playing in the background and it culminates with uh, fireworks. And the Royal Serenade uh, is a kind of touring performance inside the palace. Uh, with like demonstration of fencing, like theater, dance and music in Baroque costumes that takes you back to the 17th century courts. Whoop. 
So now we go to really joli village. So as you can see, we're not going too far from Versailles. Uh, so this one is actually north of Paris. Um, so it's a good way for me to talk about a region that I know a tiny bit because my grandparents live not so far from there. And it's actually a good way to show you that even around Paris and in like Paris suburban areas, you can find a lot of things to do as well. So it literally means uh, we call Pretty Village and got its name uh, from a legend, I would say. Uh, so King Henry IV apparently got lost in the village while hunting in 1590 and asked to people around, what is this Pretty Village? So maybe it actually came from that anecdote. That's possible. Uh, so Widijoli village, uh, Widijoli village, sorry, is located in the French Vexin, which is about, uh, which is a natural area located about 50 kilometers, so 30 miles uh, northwest of Paris and south of Normandy. So it's really at the limit of Norman Normandy and the uh, Paris uh, area. Uh, Vexin was actually the land of inspiration for writers such as uh, Balzac, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and François Mauriac, as well as painters, from Van Gogh to Camille Pissarro to Claude Monet um, and Daubigny. A lot of painters uh, went through there. So, like, yeah, I'm taking Widi Joli Village as just an excuse to talk about Vexin in general. So, I'm not going to. Um, expand more about uh, with Jolie Village. So if you are in Vexin, you can uh, stop in La Roche Guyon, uh, which is labeled prettiest village of France. <clears throat> uh, so you can find over there a castle with a 12th century med uh, medieval dungeon, uh, from which you will have a very great view over the me meandering Seine. So you can climb through the dungeon through a kind of secret passage that was uh, carved in directly into the mountains and is uh, like leads you directly to the castle uh, at the bottom. Um, do. So the medieval fortress was remodeled in the 18th century to become uh, more like uh, Baroque, um, baroque place with like a monumental entrance, new pavilions, stables, and a theater. So like yeah, the place uh, lost his uh, lost lost its fortress and like defensive purpose to become uh, a leisure space um, more modern. Uh, you can as well wander in the vegetable and fruits gardens. And so apparently uh, writers Victor Hugo and Alphonse de Lamartine stayed in the castle in the 19th century. And I've read that uh, funny anecdote about Victor Hugo who actually stayed in La Roche Guyon and wrote to uh, his daughter Adele that, um, so he was talking to the, some person walking at the, at the castle and showing him the register of, um, of people who stayed at the castle and, show like so that someone signed a message uh saying that they were victor hugo but it was actually not him so yeah there i found that quite funny uh then you can go to over sur was uh, which is located at the uh, very east side of the vexin area so uh, Oversoise is a town that attracted a lot of impressionists in the 19th century, uh, such as <clears throat> uh, Cézanne, Pissarro, Van Gogh, uh, who happens to be buried in Oversoise Cemetery. Uh, that actually may be the reason why you may have heard about uh, that, uh, that town. So you can actually uh, follow some touristic trails in order to like yeah, follow the steps of those artists and discover places they painted and actually lived in. So for example, you can go to the Ravu Hostel, which is also called the Van Gogh's house. Uh, so that's where Van Gogh spent the last 70 days of his life. Uh, you can visit as well the Charles Francois Dobigny's house and workshop and the Dr. Gachet's house, uh, Dr. Gachet, who was a friend of Van, of Van Gogh. 
so Auberture Aubert was uh, also has a nice castle. So the first version was actually built around 1635 uh, and was ordered by an Italian banker who um, was a friend of the uh, Medici family. So at first it was an Italian style mansion, but then it was converted later to a French style castle at the end of the 17th century, and then completely remodeled again in the 18th century. So when you go to that castle, you can try to go to uh, a very specific room, which is called the Nymphaeum, uh, which is a kind of uh, artificial grotto that was used as a cooling room. So before AC existed and we had cooling centers like the library is. So they had these uh, artificial grottos uh, to protect themselves from the heat. So this uh, nymph room is actually covered by a dome and the walls are decorated with shells uh, like mussel shells, abalone, pink conch, uh, as well as millstone, pebbles and glass fragments. And so this uh, nymph room, this room was actually built uh, by the first owners, um, the first Italian owners. And if you wander in the gardens, you, so you will notice that they have uh, several styles. So Italian Renaissance style uh, with some terraces, uh, the fountains and starry ales. Uh, French gardens for its geometrical patterns, as well as English gardens uh, with some curb ales and uh, irregularly shaped groves. Um, so the gardens and castles were actually completely restored in the late 1990s, 1990s, uh, following some engravings that they found from the 17th and 18th century in order to be as faithful to the original designs as possible. So here you have a, a view on the left of the Oversuwas church as it stands, and on the right, um, a painting made by Van Gogh uh, in 1890 as he was residing uh, in Oversuwas. So if you are interested in um, Impressionism and like this kind of um, following the steps of artists uh, kind of trail. Uh, you could go as well to Giverny, which is actually located not so far from uh, the Vexin area, actually on the, uh, on like very close in Normandy, about an hour away by car. So Giverny is actually the place uh, where uh, Claude Monet stayed for about 40 years, I think, uh, where he drew his inspiration uh, to paint um, the, like most of his paintings like the ponds with the lilies and so on. So yeah, that's uh, that's actually a place I would like to go to that I haven't had the opportunity to to visit yet, but it's on my list. And I would really like to see Auberture-Bois as well. Then you can go to the Villarso Estates, um, which encompasses about like, yeah, it's about 155 acre uh, big. Uh, so over there, you will find a mansion uh, so that used to be a small wooden building in, built in the 12th century, then became a medieval fortress in the 15th century to finally uh, have its uh, appearance from the Renaissance. So that's the mansion over there. <clears throat> um, so a very few elements remain from the medieval fortress, like the St. Nicholas Tower, that I think we can see on that picture. Uh, so you will find another castle called the High Castle because at the, it's at the top of a hill. So this one was built in the 18th century and has a view over the Vexin countryside, uh, which is really nice. Uh, so in that High Castle, uh, the salons are actually uh, have kept their original furniture from the 18th century. So you would find, so yeah, uh, chairs, uh, desks and so on, as well as paintings and artworks that used to decorate that space already in the 18th century. Um, and in the gardens, so you will find several styles as well. So a medieval um, garden with medicinal plants, some gardens on the water from the 16th century, 
so that you can see actually over here. And this is a very rare example of that kind of garden that is still preserved in France today. Uh, and there's uh, a park uh, which design date from the 18th century that you can see a bit more over here. So that's the high castle with a very nice view over the pond and the, the park that was designed in the 18th century. Uh, whoop. So finishing with the Vexin area, uh, with the French Vexin Regional Natural Park, which spreads around uh, 98 towns. So if you go over there, so you can stop at the Maison du Parc, which is located in the 15th century Temericourt Castle, which hosts the Museum of the French Vexin. <clears throat> um, so it hosts so yeah, uh, so this museum actually retraces the history of the area and informs the public about the local landscape, uh, flora and fauna. Uh, so over there you will find as well the Val d'Oise Archaeological Museum, uh, which shows more than 2,500 objects uh, from 90 million years ago to the 1940s. Um, so, like, yeah, you will see some prehistoric fossils and tools to antique sculptures and more contemporary artifacts um, found in the in the Vexin during that uh, own very huge time span. Uh, and all across the park, there are a lot of hiking and biking trails uh, to go from town to town, village to village, um, and to, yeah, discover the the landscapes. There are quite a few uh, events and festivals happening in the area as well. So the first one is called Intemporel. So it's a music festival that highlights the work of female artists and composers during the summer. There are about 14 concerts with about 100 artists performing in total. And um, the performance happened all across the uh, Val d'Oise department um, where the Vexin uh, area is located. Uh, so the Barrière Anguin Jazz Festival is, as you imagine, a jazz festival that lasts for about one weekend in summer with French and international musicians and singers. Uh, the Overture West Festival is an internationally renowned classical music festival that happens from spring to fall, usually from late April to late September. Uh, it showcases works by worldwide renowned composers as well as younger artists. And so this one happens usually in Overshawas, but as well in other surrounding cities uh, and in Paris as well. And Les Carrières Saint-Roch is a two-day eclectic music festival which takes place in a quarry in Luzarc in the east of Val d'Oise, so um, yeah, east of the Vexin Regional Park. So there are no uh, food specialties in the area uh, once again. So that will be that will be it for today. If you have any questions, I can try to answer to answer them as best as I can. But definitely, thank you for for your attention. I'm glad that we that we made it to almost like yeah, almost an hour. And so yes, next week will be the very last one. So we're going to visit Xanctrai, Ifignac, and Zonza. So I'm really looking forward to tell you more about those cities. And thank you again for attending the, the sessions, uh, whether you have attended all the sessions or if it's your first one, thank you for, for attending. I, I really appreciate. And I hope that you enjoy the program. All right, so if you don't think about anything to ask from the top of your head, don't hesitate to reach out to the ref staff email address or to transmit your comments and questions to that email address or to my colleagues. But yeah, thank you again for attending today. <laughs>